Good morning. So good to have you here this morning. You know, Memorial Day weekend is usually a little bit of a smaller group, so feel free to move forward if you would like to. But um, we're going to worship together this morning. You might notice Pastor Mark and Pastor Kate are not here with us this morning. If you're watching on live stream as well, welcome. Um, they are with a whole bunch of other Foursquare pastors from across the world at an international conference down in Florida. So we've been praying for them to have a good time down there, a good time of refreshment, and yeah, that they would just get ministered to there as we're doing ministry here this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we can stand and worship together. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning, for those that are logging in on live stream and watching this and those that came came here that we are looking to you um, on this Memorial Day weekend. Thank you that our hope and trust and peace is in you and that you that you offer us the fullest life. Yeah, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together as we lift our voices and praise you this morning that you would meet us here. And we just welcome your presence here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you can go ahead and stand. And join us as we sing together and worship through song this morning.
good morning. Thank you for joining us and thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we are going to be taking communion together. So if you didn't grab that on your way in, uh, there are some by the back door. You can go ahead and grab one of those little cups. And uh, in our youth group recently, in our youth group that we have here for about the past month, we've been doing a series of essentially what we are calling Bible Basics because we're really blessed to have a big community of kids that have never heard the name of Jesus before. And so we've just been going over what the Bible is and what it means and who Jesus is and his role in all of that. And I think the communion really captures all of that and symbolizes all of it really beautifully. The first communion was taken by Jesus and his disciples uh, during the Lord's Supper, which was celebrated during Passover. And Passover, if you don't know, was a time that it celebrated the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and that slavery uh, in the Old Testament. And it was centered around the meal of a lamb is what they would always traditionally eat. But that night, as Jesus sat with his disciples for the last time, he knew that he was going to be that lamb, that he was going to be that new sacrifice, and that he was going to create a new time of deliverance by his sacrifice, not one from human captors, but by the captivity of sin. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we read that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And this was going to be remembered by a new ceremonial meal, not one of a lamb, but one of communion, one of Jesus's body and his blood. Which is why in Matthew 26, we read that he tells us to take his body, take the bread that it his body broken for him, and to take the cup that it is his, his blood, and it is shed for us. So here at Trinity Faith Center, we don't require that you are a member of our church, but we do ask that if you're going to take communion with us, that you have that relationship with God, and that you know him, and that you're able to accept and acknowledge the sacrifice that he made for us and what this communion means. So we're just going to take a minute. We're going to sing another song as we sit and reflect and pray and just have a moment with God and thank you, thank him for his sacrifice for us. So in your own timing, you can take the elements as we worship.
Lord, this morning we want to thank you for your sacrifice. And we've been talking a lot about work here on Sunday mornings, and I think with all of the work that we put in throughout our week, sometimes the, uh, the blessing of your sacrifice and the miracle of you being raised to life can become very clouded and sometimes minimized and pushed aside in all of our work, Lord. But we just want to take a moment to thank you for the shedding of your blood and how your body was broken for us so that we can commune with you and we can share a meal with you and we can stand before the Lord's throne one day, something that we should not be able to do and we would never be able to do on our own. So thank you just for making all of this possible for us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, now is the time that we're going to dismiss our kids to their classes and their teachers as well. Um, and this isn't something we normally do, but could we take a minute and just give a hand to all of our Faith Kids teachers? Can we give them a hand? Because they are taking their Sunday morning and they are serving your kids and they're serving our families and they're serving our community, which is just something awesome uh, that we are so blessed to have a huge group of volunteers that do that so faithfully. And now we are also going to all stand and we're gonna take a few minutes and we're going to greet each other, say hi to someone, meet someone new, shake some hands. Well, good morning one more time. It's so good to see you all connecting with each other. Um, and that's actually something we're really excited about. I wanted to remind you all, maybe you didn't hear last week, we are transitioning for the summer to one service together at 9.30 a.m. And the, the chance of that is to really get to connect with each other. There might be some people in other service that you've never seen, and you don't even know that they come here to Cheney Faith Center. And so being able to do that at one service and then have some time after before to go out and grab coffee with people or hang out at the park because the weather is finally getting better and that's something we can go do and hang out outside. Um, and I guess I didn't introduce myself. You probably know me as one of the one of the worship leaders here. My name's Karen Triplett and I'm the worship arts pastor. So it's good to see you all here this morning. I want to remind you about one service, but also on June 12th, we are going to be doing baptisms again. Some of you might have been here on Easter. It was a really great time getting to baptize and celebrate with a lot of people who made that decision to go public with their faith on Easter. And if you want to plan ahead and know that you haven't been baptized yet or you know someone who has been looking to get baptized, we will be doing that on Sunday, June 12th here in our services. So you can go ahead and call the church office during the week um, if you are interested in doing that on June 12th. And another quick announcement that goes with our service going to one service at 930 on June 19th for the next two Sundays up until then. If you're one of those people that have kids and just brought them to class, you're good to go. We will have Faith Kids services at 8.30 service. We will not have them at the second service at 10.30. So um, just a heads up, if you decide to come to the 10.30 service, either of the next two Sundays, um, your kids can sit in church with you. And then we'll all be together starting June 19th, and Faith Kids will still be going on then. And one last, if you know any youth or you are youth, AMP Camp registration is now open. So you can, um, you could probably even talk to Amanda today or go online and figure out how to register for AMP Camp. And I'm always excited to see like the recap of that after everything that, all the fun and crazy things and what God's doing in the lives of those youth students. So um, I wanted to take a moment to introduce who's speaking this morning. You may know Chad Hogan as one of our worship leaders, if you've come here for any amount of time. And I actually have known Chad since I moved to Cheney 11 years ago. Um, when I started on worship team, he was, he was in charge of um, leading worship and all that. So many moons ago in the old church building. I don't know how many of you were around when we had the old church building. Yeah. So um, it's been a pleasure to know Chad for that long and to get to do worship with him, and to see him just step out in faith and go into teaching, because Chad is currently a teacher right now, and as we were thinking about having someone speak this morning about um, their work life and how God can use that spiritually in you during your work day, like, I think it would be great not to have someone that sits in a church building most of their day really talk about what this looks like in real life, so it can be applicable for a lot of you that might be in other jobs 
that aren't a pastoral job. And so I wanted to invite Chad Hogan up this morning, and thanks for sharing with us. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you this morning. Um, we did test the mic, but I probably, my voice booms a little bit. When you speak in a classroom every day and you don't have amplification, you get used to lifting your voice when you need to, just so long as you don't shock them. I've had students say, Mr. Hogan, as long as you don't get loud, I think it's okay. You can get pretty loud as a teacher, especially if they're about to do something you don't want them to do. Like, uh, I've, I have a student in class, sometimes he snaps the ends off pencils. And so just before he does that, I don't know if it's a God thing or what, but just before he does that, I usually catch him and I say, hey, put that away. And if I lift my voice just enough, there's a few students in class that always jars them. And try not to do that very often as a teacher. Um, thankfully, we don't cross the road or anything like that, so we don't have to worry about yeah, lifting your full voice. But they've heard me outside a couple times uh, when we call in for my students. Uh, sometimes they get extra recess. At the end of the day, they built up minutes. And as we come in, there's a second grade class that's out there, so you have to lift your voice. And one, one day uh, last week, I had given them extra minutes, and there were so many kids out there. There was a second grade class three second grade classes and a third grade class. I think they were getting extra recess. And I had to lift it pretty loud. And there was a student that was right next to me. And she said, whoa, Mr. Hogan, I've never heard you raise your voice that loud before. And I kind of looked at her and laughed. And I said, that was about two-third volume. <laughs> and she said, oh, my goodness. I'm glad you never used that in class. I said, yeah, well, you can't use that inside the building. Well, I appreciate that um, the leadership staff here, um, Mark, Kate, Melinda, April and Karen, just to name a few, asked me to do this. Um, I titled it Trusting God to Bring Purpose to Work. And specifically, I want to focus on how God uses our work to change or update or upgrade each of us. And since our world has taken such a wide view of workplace, I'm really going to talk about the work that we do. And it could mean work in any aspect. It could mean uh, work at home. It could mean stay-at-home mom raising kids. It could mean in the workplace daily, whether it be business or teaching or any of those places, but actual work. A little background on myself. I'm one of three children raised by Patrick and Sharon Hogan of Reardon, Washington. I have a beautiful wife, Rachel, of nearly 24 years and three adult children. I've been teaching in Cheney and for the last nine years, and I was a pastor for more than a decade and a teacher before that, at Liberty School District. Um, you're going to bear with me. It'll get comical here in just a minute with the amount of jobs that I've had. In fact, I've had various jobs that have provided me with a collection of hairnets and name tags, tool belts, on-the-job experience, and even some time working in the fishing industry in Alaska. So my past job experiencing, experience is just as diverse as my past jobs are numerous, and you're about to hear some of them right now. In fact, when I was listing them, I went... Gosh, this is getting a little comical. How many jobs have I had? There are some I'm sure that I forgot. Uh, if my wife's watching, she's probably going to remember those ones. So my first job, uh, I was a landscape artist. I was 12. <laughs> I was a lawnmower, and I like to give it affectionate titles as I was pushing the lawnmower around in Reardon, Washington. Had about eight clients, got up to 11. I'd tell them how I could sculpt their yard and make it look beautiful, pristine. I'd bag the grass, get rid of it. But in all reality, I was just singing songs in my head. I, I wasn't doing anything more than mowing lawns. I was a hired hand on a farm, bucking bales. I drove tractor. I've worked harvest before. I've worked at a car wash, the Spokesman Review, the Onion Restaurant as a waiter, and Chapter 11 Steakhouse as a waiter. I've worked for retail stores as a loss prevention agent. I sold shoes at Foot Locker. I worked in Alaska during halibut, salmon, and crab seasons, as well as in the construction industry. I've been an employee in home health care. I've worked for World Relief, resettling refugees, as well as coach athletes in elementary, middle school, and high school. I have an AA degree in criminal justice and a bachelor's degree in education. I'm not an actor, nor have I ever played one on TV. <laughs> my work experience may be vast, but none of my work or jobs were ever a calling to me. 
until I became a Christ follower. Then after I started following Christ, every job was. Although I'm just a man and one who still makes mistakes, so I wanted to preface about anything I'm about to say, just because I'm up here definitely doesn't mean that I do this right. In fact, there are days I feel like I'm sitting on the bench checked out, and about the last half hour of the day, it's like God rattles me, and it could be, you need to pray for this student. And it's usually because the student is standing right in front of me going, Mr. Hogan, I don't feel very good. And my instant response is, suck it up. You're going to be okay. There's only 20 minutes left in the day. And that thought I have to override. And a lot of times that takes Jesus because you get a lot of these a day. And there's some teachers in here. You know what I'm talking about. The smallest owie. I mean, I have a collection of at least 300 Band-Aids under there so that no student could ever run out. I have a cut. Can I? Oh, is there, they're under the sink. Go ahead and get one. Oh. Do I need the pass? Nope, you don't need the pass. They're under the sink right over there. Can you help me? No, no, you can put it on. You're 10, you're 11 years old, you got this. So I need Jesus at times to rattle me, but there are times I feel like I'm not really in the game. I'm just kind of plodding along through life, my job, seven, eight hours a day. Anyone ever been there? You feel like work's just carrying you along. Now the worst days are when you're looking at that clock, and we all know the more you look at the clock, the more it slows the day down. So you try not to do that. In fact, as we're approaching the end of our school year, I have to not consider how many days are left. Because in Alaska, we had this person named L.A. Steve, and he was from L.A., but he was a short-timer in everything that he did. And when I say short-timer, it just means he had that mindset of, I'm out of here in five minutes. Even if he had 14 hours left in his shift, I'm out of here in five minutes. Plod along. He drove forklift, and we had to wait for him all the time, and it made the day drag on as you're waiting in a 40-degree uh, uh, refrigerated um, container van, and he's plodding along with the forklift at slow speed because he doesn't want to rev it too high. He doesn't want the mechanics to have to work on it. It was hard. There are days like that when you're looking at the clock, and it feels like work just plods on. Christ changed that perspective for me. Now, I became a Christian when I was 22. It was a lot of years ago, 1992. And that was when I took off for Alaska. When I turned my life over to him and began following him, he actively began changing me. It took a number of years for me to learn that every job a person works can be a calling if Christ is the person that I follow and I truly trust and not me. Gratefulness is what comes to mind when I reflect on how God has changed me using my work, the hours that I'm in work. My conversion from living a life directed by me into a life directed by God was a miracle to me. Christ comes to live inside and he leaves his Holy Spirit as evidence to help make sure that I change. This brings me to my first point if you're taking notes. Jesus lives in me, which means so does the Holy Spirit, which is a good thing. The Holy Spirit is meant to change us. In fact, I don't know how a person can be a Christian say I'm following Christ without the Holy Spirit really actively doing work. You almost have to block him. I have to block out thoughts in my head and just say, I'm just going to make it till the end of the day. And I've done jobs like that, and I've had days like that. In John 15, verse 26, it says, But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Advocate is a legal term meaning to comfort and counsel. And thank goodness that God left us his Holy Spirit to comfort and counsel us humans. Otherwise, that hope would be there for me. That hope would not be there for me or you to change. We'd be wondering, I had this experience. Now what comes next? If you've lived on this planet for even 10 plus years, you know how difficult, near impossible it is for a person to change. It's difficult. Even if someone sets out to, I'm going to change myself. I'm going to change this about me. This year, I'm really going to focus on that. It's difficult to change. That's why I'm so glad the Holy Spirit, that God left him and that he can fill us up. I forget sometimes, say, Lord, would you fill me up with your Holy Spirit? Because I, I, I remember that I leak. And I don't know where, I don't know where the holes are exactly, but I do because it only takes a couple hours being with 24 students and you start to feel like, whoa, I'm, I'm reacting out of that part inside of me that's almost primal. No, nope, no, you can't do that right now. So I have to calm it down and I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that he, he tempers that because I used to have a temper. 
So if the Holy Spirit lives in us and he works for and with us to continue the work of Jesus, then how does he get this work done? Is it when we're asleep? Is it during our free time? Is it during our work hours? How does he get it done? Galatians 5, through 23 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Now, there were over 10 listed. I dare say I don't experience those 10 at one time. And um, I, I've, if, I, if I took a poll here, I bet there aren't very many people who say, yep, I'm experiencing all 10 of those at once. I don't know what that would look like. It would be kind of like, <laughs> I, I don't know. If, if I'm experiencing all those things, part of them are kind of calming and tranquil. You know, the, um, the patience, the peace, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, and the gentle self-control. The love and the joy, you know, if it's anything like the type of love I feel towards my wife or my kids, that type of love and joy is like, man, that's awesome. When they do something great, oh, yes. And all those emotions together would look kind of weird. It'd be kind of, <laughs> I, I, it just, it'd be strange if you're experiencing those all at once. But I'm, I'm so thankful that God filled us with a, his Holy Spirit. And then it's like he knows with a governor, like a governor that controls the, the speed of engines in big trucks, it's like he knows what one we need at the right time, especially if I'm trusting him through my day. Up, oh, you need to be patient here, Mr. Hogan, or you need to be calm here. You need to be gentle right here. This student needs it. And if it weren't for the Holy Spirit, I would probably run roughshod over the top of these 24 heads and at the end of the day go, all right, we got a lot done, didn't we? And they're in various states of, uh, uh, yeah, we did. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And I used to think when I'd hear this scripture, fruit, what are you talking about fruit? It just means evidence of change, proof that God's at work inside of us. So this list that I told you, the list of work that I've involved with, that list was not complete. There were other jobs in there. I just thought if I went on too long, they'd think, oh, that's silly. He hasn't worked that many jobs. I think I recorded at one time 30 different jobs that I worked uh, before I got my teaching degree. 30 different jobs, various jobs. Like I said, I worked at a car wash. I was the car wash dryer for a time. I was also the car wash inside cleaner guy, but I get distracted because they let us drive the cars that were in there about 10 feet onto the little bumper things that then take the car through. So I get in like a brand new Corvette and I'd be doing all the bells and whistles because the guy's behind, a, he's behind a, a, a door, he's making his way, he's paying. So I knew I had at least 15 seconds to test out all the things in this Corvette before he was in the glass windows looking at his car. And so when I got in there, I gave a quick spritz. All right, what's this dude? What's this dude? What's that? And then I look up. Okay, good, he's not there yet. And all the time, the partner, my partner in crime, he would be lookout while I was doing the car, and I was supposed to be cleaning the inside of it. Like I said, most of the time, I was just testing everything out. And then we'd take turns, and I'd be lookout, and he'd be that guy. A lot of jobs like that. I could, just like you, list the work done as a son for parents, the work as a husband for my wife, the work of a parent for my children. Each of us, though, I bet, has an exhaustive list. Once you become an adult, you hit somewhere around 24, 25, and I don't mean to say you're not an adult when you're 18 or you're not a, a budgeting adult when you're 17. It's just something happens around 25, 26. The expectations rise. People look at you different, and, and you start to feel like, I better do something here. I want to focus for a minute on the work I did before I began following Christ. So daily, I ask myself, while running a grain elevator on the outskirts of a small town called Edwall, how does this make any difference in the world? My answer was usually something like, well, this is going to pay X amount of dollars for which I can use to purchase a new car, or I can go to college, or get a better apartment, or provide for myself. My answers were usually self-promoting. I wish I could say that I daily emptied dry, dusty, itchy wheat and barley trucks because I believe my job played a vital part in feeding the hungry of the world. The truth was less noble. The overtime hours, sometimes 45 in one week, 
paid for college registration or a car payment. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just didn't think of my job as a calling. I mean, I was lifting the end gates on trucks. No one could argue, ah, oh, that's when you were young, or you didn't know any better, or you were still finding yourself. I've been asked if I truly believe that only those who follow Jesus can serve his or her fellow humans. So are, are Christians the only one who really have purpose in life? And I would answer, no, absolutely not. I've witnessed other people who I knew weren't Christ followers, who were adamantly against following Christ. I've witnessed them serve their fellow human beings. I know it can be done. You've witnessed them too. However, the human condition reveals that all relationships will eventually have stress introduced into them. And without Christ, it's extremely difficult to put someone else's needs before your very own. And that's when you start to see things crumble, Christian or non-Christian. I went years not understanding how God wants to use each one of us to do our part to introduce his son Jesus to others. Years, more than a decade. Once I saw how Christ wanted to use me and would use me in his plans if I let him and that I could work my job with purpose, even the job of cleaning out the gut machine on the cold storage dock of a sockeye salmon plant in Dillingham, Alaska, or hauling trash for the physically handicapped or installing toilets for the elderly was a purposeful job. Yes, even cleaning out this giant gut machine in Alaska, which was disgusting. It was below the dock. It, the, the gut machine had these gears on it that when the guts from the sockeye salmon slid down this little chute, it hit these gears, and I think the engineers just laughed every time they sent somebody down there. These engineers could fashion things all the time that help, helped us when we worked, but they had yet to put any covers over those gears, and so when the guts would come down there, it'd just be <laughs> against the metal walls, and it was like a little box, a metal box. And you got sent down to the gut machine because you were smarting off, you uh, maybe talked to the, the Japanese quality control engineers incorrectly, which I did often, or maybe you uh, were just entertaining people instead of working, which, yes, I was guilty of that as well. And you got sent down there, and sometimes it was just for a half an hour, but when I got sent down there, it was usually for half the day. And you put rain gear on, and you made sure you had a face covering like a shield because literally when those things slid down there and hit those gears, it was just a splat against the wall. And so you were supposed to be cleaning it, which usually you did at the end of a shift. And I mean, everybody knew when I got sent down there halfway into our shift, it was <laughs> you stupid Hogan. And, and the engineer would lift up the, there's a little hatch that you climb down this ladder into this metal box. He'd say, hey, I want to see it cleaned off. I want to make sure there's no guts in there. And I'd look up and say, Harry, they're just going to send more down. The shift's not over yet. I told you what I told you. Now get to work. So I'd clean the thing. I had my huge scrub brush. I had a sponge. I had soap and everything. Clean the thing off. And then you'd hear the horn of another boat come in. And you knew, oh, there's going to be more fish coming down that rail. The fish would be put on these pegs. And these pegs would chop the heads off, and I won't go into the whole gory details, but eventually the end would come to me, and I'd be cleaning that thing over and over and over again. But you'd think I'd learn my lesson. No, I've visited the gut machine, I don't know how many times, at least 10. And every time I thought it was because I was entertaining the troops, not the troops, but the, the college students who were like me, pulled from different parts of the country. There was about 150 of us all there. It was kind of fun entertaining them. So I endured the gut machine. Well, you could say, oh, that's when you were young or you didn't know any better. But this stress that gets introduced into our lives, and we all know it, if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, significant other, two best friends even, you know that eventually stress gets introduced into a relationship and how you handle that stress determines the continuing of that relationship. So, how can you be used at work? Well, without Christ's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those things might have been evident in me from time to time, one at a time, even if I really focused. But with Christ, the more I invited him to take over my life 
and make me more like him, the more I became more like him. And the Bible calls this change that I already spoke about fruit. And what I mean is something like this before you head to work or on the way. Lord, I just want to give you my day today. Sometimes I don't know what that means, but I do know when I take it back is that I try controlling everything in my whole environment. And I just pray you'd help me to take notice of the people around me and respond to them and not the things I need to accomplish. Thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. That's what it looks like. Just giving your day to them. I think it took me less than 15 seconds. And sometimes throughout the day, I'm checking back in with them. And I hope every day that I can say, oh, I checked in with them two or three times. And I'm probably speaking to the choir here, so to speak. Many of you do this every day. Well, the Holy Spirit really began to produce fruit or evidence that change was taking place in my life back in my 20s. And this leads me to point number two. Jesus uses work to change me, and he'll use it to change you as well. On average, we humans spend our lives using the resource of time in three different ways. One third of our life is spent with waking hours. One third is supposed to be spent sleeping, although I don't know how people sleep eight hours. It's just me. I can't do it. And the last third is typically spent devoting oneself towards work or some endeavor that we're putting our focus and time to for a certain amount of hours every single day. Since sleeping does not allow one to consciously consider how to bring about self-change, and our waking hours that are not work-related are usually divided between many things at once, for example, eating, driving, relaxing, having hobbies, waiting in line, and entertaining ourselves, just to name a few, would not the work hours be a prime place to change me and you from mainly focused on ourselves and our own purposes to focusing on others and his purpose? I mean, Jesus has eight to 10 hours to work with for each of us, five days a week at least. If you're a teacher, that math means that God can work on me for 180 days. <laughs> 180 days because I only work nine months of the year. I love it when people bring that one up. Well, you get your whole summers off. And I won't belabor the point, but I, it takes about two weeks to unwind from that constant, your switch is flipped when you hit school. And I know right now that really only there's a few teachers in the room who are going, I know what you mean by the switch being flipped. And I've worked other jobs. You've heard me say a list of at least 20 of them. So I can say this from experience. For me personally, there's nothing quite like the switch of teaching that gets flipped every single day. And it happens about four minutes before you know they're entering that building. And you walk past the windows and see them lining up. And then all of a sudden, my stomach starts to do a little rumble. My heart starts pounding a little harder. And I'm going, okay, do I have the first three things lined up? Because these guys will eat me alive if I don't have this ready. Or it just won't go that good. It's a little less dramatic. It just won't go as well. Everyone else, you have 365 days of the year. Now, if you take away vacations and same things like that, it's a little bit less. But he has this huge amount of time that he could use to physically, spiritually, and emotionally change us. And for so long at work, I didn't even consider that God would do that. I had my stuff to focus on. I wanted to move up. And this was when I was younger. And so I wasn't focusing on letting God into my work. I remember my mom and my dad talking about it at times. And I think, how in the world do they have time to talk to God when they're at work? I got enough things to do. And if I don't keep my mind focused on this thing, depending on what your job is, if you're running a gut machine, you definitely don't want to drop your hand anywhere close to those gears. So if you're just thinking about God's joy and peace and all of a sudden, you don't want that to happen. And if you're driving a truck, heavy load truck, you don't want to be crossing the center line. How, how do people do that? In Colossians 3, thank you, Buck. In Colossians 3, it says this, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And this is where I want us to focus. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you and I died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Which just means when Jesus comes back in the end, if we're still standing on planet Earth, you get to go, there he is. I knew it. Without so much arrogance, we're all getting to go see Jesus. Yes, I'm saved. And I hope I don't point out to people. I hope I don't do this. I really hope. I can say in my mind, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to say, I told you so, because that would be terrible. I mean, that would be really bad. 
There are times we've all thought that though, right? You may not think this now, but Jesus is real and someday you're gonna see. Yeah, I've definitely had those thoughts roll through my head. They're not the most productive though. I wanna finish. Verse five says this, and when these thoughts enter in, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking in you. I like the New Living Translation for that line there. They lurk inside you. You think they might be gone, but sometimes they spring up at the worst moments. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. And just a little side note, just because when I'm reading these, sometimes I think, answer it right now. This is part of the fifth grade teacher in me. An idolater is basically a person who worships things made by human hands. And if I was to worship this microphone, oh, you were so good. I'm going to devote all my time to you today that you would think he's lost it. He's a little bit bent. And you should. But it's amazing how sometimes I can devote hours of my day, like on a day off, to watching TV. And I think I'm watching a basketball game, man. This is three hours. This is not just entertainment. This is the whole country's involved in this. The whole country is not involved in watching an NBA basketball game. I, doubt, I dare say maybe even 20% of people involved are watching it. And I'm not on Twitter connecting with those people, so what am I really doing? I'm entertaining myself or keeping myself from mowing the lawn or folding clothes or fixing that closet door that I said, I'll get to that this weekend. The game's on, honey. And usually my wife goes, I, yeah, he only watches about one of those a week, so I get a free pass. Yes. But we find ways to numb ourselves to go back to living regular life. And if you do it too often, you get out of balance and pretty soon God isn't shaping or changing anything in me because I'm just filling the places that he could fill with everything else. So that's idolatry, just worshiping something made by human hands. Verse six says, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, malice, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. And Colossians, if you're ever wondering how a Christian should act and behave and do regular life, seriously, go read the book of Colossians a couple times. You could, you could stay in chapter three for a little bit and go, man, is this for real? And then you read a verse like that, but now's the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Oh man, all those were part of my life before Christ. And sometimes the anger and rage part, I just got to push that down. Have you ever wondered, what's God's main purpose for me? Well, I've spent more time pondering this question than I care to calculate, considering that the evidence has been around for at least a thousand years, the written word, God's, the Bible. Luke 19.10, and some of these verses I won't be on screen. So Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And in Matthew 28, 19-20, it says, Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples and baptize people. A disciple is a follower of Christ, which means that we are to do these things as well. After my first three years of teaching at Liberty, I took a spot as a youth pastor at Summit Church, and I really felt like this will be the calling that I've been looking for. I remember I left teaching pretty, pretty easy, and it, it was early. I mean, it was the first three years of my teaching career, and I'd spent 13 grand in order to get that degree, and I remember my parents going, and my dad was a pastor at the time, that's cool, you're gonna be a pastor, but you spent all this time and money to be a teacher. Oh, I'll still get to teach, mom and dad. I think at the time I was really thinking that pastoring would be more of a calling than teaching, or that teaching would be more of a calling than running the gut machine in Alaska, right? But I'm here talking seriously to you. I do now, my whole life has changed to thinking I, I can be fulfilling my calling at a job no matter what the job is. I really can. And, and, and because you don't know me from when I was 22 years old, you don't know how much of a miracle that was and how much a change that was. And it's a relief at times to see that I'm working for Christ, just going to work, as long as the lights are on. And what I mean by that, I think you understand, is that I'm checking in with him daily. I'm not just accomplishing my to-do list and, and running through my day. Does knowing that God wants to use your job to help you make you, more like him, does that fill you with dread? I'm going to become more like God at work. What? Or does it fill you with relief? 
initially when I first felt like God was not talking to me. I didn't hear verbal, but the verses would come up when I'm at work. You encounter somebody who says, yeah, life's just difficult right now. I've got this going on with my family. Uh, my mom's acting this way towards me. I'm going to have to move out. So I was in my 20s. And I'd think, man, here's a solution for that. Just do this. And I'd have a quick solution for somebody. And usually I, I didn't listen to them too well. And this happened frequently. So when God started to change that to where I was listening more and I didn't have these quick fixes or solutions, I actually panicked a little, like, where, where's the solution? That this guy wants a solution. I know he wants a solution. Turns out most people don't. They just want you to listen. And God started changing that. That was one of the first things he started changing in me. Well, God can and wants to use you at your job to move coworkers, customers, and bosses a little closer to him. Are you willing? Whether you're in maintenance, aviation, cleaning, teaching, water conservation, health and beauty, or any other field of work, God wants to use you in your work for you to be more like him. Being more like Jesus means he will use the relationships of those around you, a coworker, a boss, a customer, to teach you character traits like humility, patience, self-control, integrity, trustworthiness, honesty. Those are just to name a few. He'll use your coworkers to help you teach you that. That sounds like that could be a little humiliating at times. Yeah. When you make a mistake, you could just act like it didn't happen or pawn it off on somebody else. But if you own up to it, man, the other person, I, I don't know exactly what they're thinking, but I've witnessed someone else making mistakes and owning up to them, I think, responsible, accountable, integrity. And those are... Those are the things I would imagine other people think as well. And God started to change this whole way about how I viewed work, that it didn't have to be, oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, now I'm a pastor. Oh, now I'm a lead pastor. It didn't have to be any of those things. And while I, when I left pastoring from this very church back in 2013, I was, I was scared. I had a short-term or one-year contract at Cheney. One year as an audition, you hopefully at the end of nine months, they like you enough that they're going to sign you, sign you up. And that happened. And I was so grateful. I thought, okay, now I'll treat teaching so much different than I did before. And I have, it's been a, like a whole new profession. But I know now when I have summers off and I take a job during the summer, I see that job is just as important as teaching. And for me, that's like a miracle inside. This work that God wants to use to shape you is one of the things that draws others around you to ask themselves and maybe ask even this question, what's different about this person? I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different about you. So imagine somebody at your work coming up and saying that. To me, that would be like one of the best things that somebody could say around me. Oh my goodness. And it used to be because I felt like an attaboy. All right, they noticed I'm a Jesus follower. Now it feels more like, all right, a door's opening. This is awesome. How, then comes the hard part. How do I go through that door without kicking it open and going, let me tell you about Jesus. And then they go like, oh, that's not what I was talking about. You weirdo. Yeah, that doesn't work. But I like puzzles in the sense of figuring people out as a puzzle. I don't so much like the puzzles, the 500 pieces. I mostly just want to sweep those off the top of the table. Let's go do something else. Let's go outside. But I like the puzzle of figuring out people. And God definitely gives us that when that question's asked or that comment's made. This question and comment may lead you to a larger conversation with a coworker or afford you more leeway than what you would have had without demonstrating Christ-like character at work. But it may also put a target on you. Colossians 3, 16 through 17 says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So this is basically saying in everything that we're to do at work, constantly giving thanks to him, worshiping him. Can you do that while you're at work? Yeah, there's times that I'm worshiping him, singing the song that we had that won't get out of my head that I used to think was a bad thing. And it is if you're singing a Gilligan's Island thing. Yes, you don't want that in your head. 
But if you're singing, I will bow down to say, to show you that I need you. Those words, I can be worshiping God when I'm at work. And it changes my perspective for the people that are in front of me. Before Jesus, I saw nothing wrong with calling in sick if I needed a mental day or I physically didn't feel like going to work for the day. But that was not my most selfish work-related character trait. Actually, being a thief, being a thief was. Not some huge bank heist kind of thievery, but the smallest things. So from work, from jobs, I would take pens, extra napkins from the break room, forks or any silverware, because a struggling college kid needs more cutlery, because the two sets that you have in your drawer just don't cut it when people come over. Or sometimes I'd steal by wasting the last 15 minutes of my shift because I felt as though I had worked hard enough to deserve doing nothing for the last 15 minutes of the day. In addition to that, I frequently found passive-aggressive ways to avoid following through on a boss's requests that I particularly did not like. I can tell you that the Chad you see before you has had a lot of rough edges taken off by God and through my working hours. The third point is, you don't have to be a pastor to be a discipleship, to be a disciple maker. And thank goodness for that. But then, there's the other side to it. Um, you mean all of us are supposed to? Yep. And I've, I've been one of those guys who thought, I'm just a seed planter. I just plant that little seed by my good actions. Or I just water them. You know, somebody that's already started to take Jesus on there, following him, I'm going to help. I'm going to give you some water, make that plant grow a little bit more. And I think too often we think we're only one and not the other. But there'll be a time for both. And it's in those heart-pounding moments where somebody says something like, there's something different about you. What is it? And they wait, and there's a silence, and you're going, oh, they really want to an answer. Um, uh, uh, I like Giovanni. I don't know. No. Where you go, Lord, please give me the right words so I don't freak him out, but I can continue the conversation. And that's God shaping you at work. 1 Peter 3 says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Whether you think you are in good enough standing with Jesus or not, once you know him, do not miss an opportunity to live out or speak out his example. So I say to live out. And then, and then you'll, you'll earn the right to speak out. If you put it the opposite way around, if you go with the speak out first, you probably won't get a second chance. And, and I've done that before and felt like uh, I need a do-over or I've wrecked something. Or you curse at your job and they know you as a Christ follower. Oh, man. Gosh, that's so embarrassing. Now I need a do-over. You want to leave this job on the table and head to another one. I've been there. I've done that. In John 15, it says, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he goes, I've loved you even as a father, as the fathers love me. I want you to stay in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. And just as I obey my father's commandments, I remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with joy, not dread, joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in slaves. Now you're my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. Jesus is basically telling us the chain of command. I've loved you because I watch God, my Father, love. You will love because you've witnessed me loving others, and we have the Bible to do that. And every year I, I make it a point to read through the four Gospels, the red letters, because as much as I like reading Paul's writings, which I really do, I want to know what Jesus did and how he acted. And then he says, I can now call you friends because I know that you can be trusted. And isn't that what relationships are about? Is a mutual trust willing us to be a little bit more transparent with somebody. And the more you're a little bit more transparent, your relationship grows. You're a little bit more transparent or that's reciprocated, your relationship grows. 
pretty soon, a person will trust some of the deeper things of life to you. But you have to build that relationship first, and it takes time. Over the last 20 years, God has conditioned me to see work less like how I want and more like how he wants. He sees work as an opportunity to change me and love others more. I began looking at work or jobs as a way that I could be a part of God's great commission. Like, I'm actually a part of this now. I'm not afraid of it. I mean, I'm still afraid of parts of it, but I'm not afraid of being lumped in with, I think I'm doing the Great Commission. The Great Commission, if you're wondering, is a Christian mandate. It's given to us by Jesus in Matthew 19 and 20. It says, go into all the world and make disciples from people who previously did not know Jesus. And then it says to baptize them. I've only been a part of a few baptisms, and that's always a little intimidating. Is like, is water going to get up this person's nose? Am I doing this right? It's less about the spiritual stuff, and I hope they don't come up coughing and look at me like, you're a pastor? Or you're my dad, because I've baptized my kids before. I got to baptize my wife. And those were the things I was thinking. I was mainly thinking right before it happened, oh, I hope they don't get water up their nose. <laughs> and this experience will be like, thank you, Jesus, but <coughs> this guy is a dirt jerk. The spiritual part of the baptism, though, just saying out loud, look at what God's doing in me. Those moments, man, those are so great and getting to be a part of those. Disciple, it's definitely a Christian term. And it simply makes, it means take time to build relationship with a person that includes mutual trust, which means we cannot be pretenders in loving others. Genuine platonic love requires time, effort, and concentration. Fake it till you make it. This strategy will not suffice. People eventually see through a fake. As teachers, we get summers off. Yes. Who wouldn't want a summer off? Well, God started to show me that he could use my summers off if I was willing to trust him. What if I could take on a summer job, earn a little extra money, and allow God to use me in a way that could connect someone who did not know Jesus into someone who was curious about Jesus? What if God led me to a job that he wanted me to live out Christ-like character, then present the words of Christ and offer to pray with someone and disciple that person? No, oh, yikes, at work? What? I'm more of a seed planting guy, Lord. I mean, I grow flowers at home. This is what I would think in my head. I have a pretty good track record with transplanting the starters I get from Walmart and Bimart. I mean, God, that's what I do. I transplant those things. They don't lose any of their shine with me. I now have how to engineer drip lines so that the plants get the most water. I put it in our sprinkler system. I would recite some of these things to God saying, this is the guy I should be, Lord. Work. It's a place where those who do not love me, who control my time and my paycheck and include people who I like and some that I just tolerate, exist for eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week. According to an article from Revised Sociology and, and a survey taken in 2014, the average Brit or American will spend approximately 90,000 hours of a given lifetime working. That amounts to about 13 years, a little over 13 years of your life. So if you plan on living to 80, which I don't know how you just plan on, I'm going to live to 80, but if you hope to live to 80, you have, hope to live to 90, 13 of those years, think of it, will be spent at work. 90,000 hours. Think of all the time that God could use during those working hours for not just you completing your job and maybe even getting a promotion and moving up, but also becoming more like him. I used to think of it, it was a and or. So if I don't do my devotions in the morning, I'm not becoming more like Christ. And then I go to work. Ah, oh, I'm too tired after work. I got to help make dinner, get the kids ready for bed, read them a story, try to read the Bible then. I'm falling asleep. Okay, I didn't get shaped more like Christ today. Hello, what about those eight hours of your work? Oh, you can use those? Yeah, I, I really had to start going, Lord, would you please use those? Because today I didn't get a chance to touch base with you in any other way. God wants to use us if, we, if we'd allow him to let us humble him, humble ourselves, to help us be more patient and kind. I want to illustrate with this story before I finish. The summer of 2015 loomed large in our family for various reasons. Our middle daughter was about to be the first one of the three to get married. 
we had major car repairs and our two aging vehicles were upcoming, these repairs. And I was trying to pay off the last of my student loans. I had been back teaching for two years and had yet to take a summer off because summer was a time that I could make a little extra money. The job I had worked at the previous summer was not hiring and prospects back in my hometown were not prosperous as well. I thought I could go back, do the farming thing because uh, that's what I did through high school, but it all dried up. I was even contemplating putting out applications. That's how much we needed uh, that extra money. First, I began with praying. I asked God to use me, not just to make more money, but I wanted to be a part of what he was doing. And for the first time in my life, I thought, man, he could use my summer job to actually be part of the Great Commission. <sighs> this is kind of cool. I've never thought of it this way, Lord. I had spent the last 13 years in ministry, and I felt like... I had not been a part of leading anyone to Jesus unless they walked in my door. I wanted to be in a place and at a place where I was more like Christ, but also a place where I was part of the process of leading someone to Jesus. I had a lead on a job from my son-in-law, and it was something I had never done before with a car importing business for which I had no connections. Making matters worse was the fact that the spot I would be filling at my 45 years of age would be with two 20-something guys working outside, and both were from the armed forces, physically fit, ready to go, locked in. They had their business in order. There would be no cover in this workplace if we were out in the open air. There's no air conditioning, and I would be removing odometer clusters that were in kilometers, having come from Canada, sending them to a business to convert them to miles, and then reinstalling the clusters and taking the car to auction. <laughs> All nothing I knew anything about. And I thought when my son-in-law, when I said, hey, you know anybody who needs a little help over the summer? And he brought up this job. At first I thought, all right, a job. And then as he started the next day, he laid out a few more details and the next day, and that's when he told me, I set up a meet and greet for you. And he laid out the final details, of these cherries that I just spoke to you here about replacing odometers. And I, I said, I'll have to physically be taking those out myself. I didn't even know the odometer was called a cluster, and you can take them out of a car? Isn't that illegal? And he's like, oh, no, no. He didn't say something like we do it all the time. He said that the federal government actually says we have to take them out and convert them to miles. They'll show you how to do that. Some of them have like 10 screws, and some of them only have four, and instantly it's just like, Phew. my heart starts pounding, cold sweat's going down. I'm like, should I tell him no right here? Should I tell him no? I can't do this job. Plus the fact that we're going to be working outside in a lot with no trees and it was one of the hottest summers on record until last summer. We got up to 98 and 100 a couple times when we were out there. And you're supposed to wear your Carhartt type of thicker work pants. Oh man, every day it seemed like I just should bring two sets of clothes to work because I was sweating through them. I was 45 and I'd be working outside for the next eight weeks in one of the hottest summers on record in a car lot of gravel whose only job was to welcome the sweltering heat and hold these cars until auction. This was not the job I had imagined I would be doing for the summer. I agreed to the meet and greet before reporting to my first day of work, and it did not go well. While meeting the crew, I came off as a bit needy, trying to be humble but confident at the same time, all the while explaining that I've never done this job, which is hard to do when you're trying to meet and greet people and tell them, I'll be your new coworker, and I've never done this job, and it looks like it takes a little bit of skill. <laughs> it's not like I'm just putting guts, cleaning up a gut machine. All parties perceived that I was here because this was a favor and that all involved, including myself, doubted this would work out. It was awkward, to say the least. For all the things I was unsure about, though, there was one thing I knew for sure. Somehow God kept telling me, this is where you're supposed to be. I go home each of those three nights and go, Rachel, I don't think this is going to work out. But for some weird reasons, it's like God wants me to put myself out there. I don't know how humiliating this is going to be, but I'm, I'm going to do it. So I took, took the job. This was a family-owned business with th three generations involved in it. And although I was not the best fit for their business, God really connected me to the two young men who worked in this import lot. I'll call the men Manny and James. I really thought I hit it off with Manny in my first few days, only to find out that months later he was planning on recommending to his mother, who owned the business, that I be let go because I was too slow and too unknowing. <laughs> Both men were skeptical of me, but to their credit, they trained me as if I was going to make their business my future career. 
Besides the work ethic of both men, I was impressed by how before leaving, each hugged the two owners. Manny, of course, it was his mom and his stepdad, no big deal there, before they left for the night. But James, he did the same thing. And they weren't friends from back in the day. He had just started about a month or two before me. And so him hugging them saying, love you, love you, I thought, whoa, this is weird. I hope they're not planning on me reciprocating. I just thought, that's the 20-somethings. It's those millennials. I, I, I grew tired of using that, but it's funny. It fits there, so I just thought, it's those millennials. <laughs> but on the fifth night of my job there, God prompted me to do the same thing. And I remember just going, what? Inside of me, it's like God flipped the switch that he seems to work with me with. My heart starts pounding over nothing, and you know, nothing's been said, and I'm going, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to do the same thing? Nah, this is just, this is me thinking this. I'm just thinking I need to fit in with the tribe here. And no, it wasn't, because little did I know that gesture would mean something to them. I went in for the hug. The mom was visibly taken aback. She kind of like, uh, mm. I'm 45, and she was just a few years older than me. <laughs> It was awkward, and I just kind of went in for the side hug, in, and I said, love you. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then I went in on the stepdad, who was this gruff guy who, uh, when you shook your hand, it felt like your arm was going to get ripped off. Boom. He tried to put, his, put her there, and I did the shake the hand, love you, man. Give him a swat on the back. And when I was walking away, I felt like, oh, gosh, I'm not coming back tomorrow. And I bet they don't want me to come back. I kind of looked over at the two guys, and both of them were like, <laughs> they're kind of laughing. And then Manny, he's the, the, the mom's, the son of the owner, he just goes, that was awesome. Let's go. And that night was the first time he invited me to do something with them, which, um, real quick, this verse just jumped into my mind. And I do have it in my notes. I thought, do I put this in? But it does bear a witness here. In Romans 12, 9, it says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Yes. And for me, it was like God was saying, I know you're not pretending. And I thought, okay, if I have to go through with this, if that's what you mean by not pretending to love, to love but really loving, Lord, I can look like a fool for you. I didn't know that, but God would use that gesture to speak to both of those young men. Although I tried to keep an unwritten rule of not hanging out with 20-somethings unless I was mentoring them because I was 45, I was invited to hang out with them and be part of the tribe. Each time I went to jump off cliffs or snorkeling or mountain biking, I could sense the skepticism on the part of their friends that had also been invited to join. But because I was with Manny and James, I was welcomed in. The summer was about over, however, though, with each passing day, and I could sense a curiosity on behalf of Manny and James that went past work. It was interesting. Then it happened. We were sitting in a worn-out Jeep Liberty waiting for one of the guys to drop off his vehicle in the simmering heat. The temperature was about 98 degrees, and no one was really talking. Out of the clear blue sky, Manny asked how someone my age with so little experience in a field of work can just think he will get hired on, succeed in keeping up with them, and keep such an upbeat attitude. He laughed as he remarked, I don't think you're on drugs, but I guess it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I would later learn that he had asked that question because he believed I might have God. He had said to James, that guy might have God or something, I don't know, but I don't want to hear about it. I just am curious, are you curious? He told me later about this conversation. So he'd said to James, are you curious how this guy can do this day in and day out? He's got a smile on his face. The guy sweats through all of his clothes. You notice he's changing clothes at lunch, which I was. I couldn't stand, I'm in a job indoors in air conditioning. I mean, I had sweat in my pants down here. It almost looked like I wet my pants. It was just sweat. But those guys would remark about it. So I go in at lunch. I brought two sets of clothes every day, <laughs> change into them. That's how hot it was every day. When you're teaching, that doesn't happen. I mean, one of the reasons I got a teaching degree was so I could be indoors <laughs> and work inside. And I could have summers off. So Manny had all these thoughts going in his head, but I didn't blow it. 
He didn't want to talk about God because of his past hurts. However, he did want to talk. The door was open. And he had noticed a difference in me. I didn't know about these past hurts, but God did. And he really tempered what I said with grace. I responded to him by telling him and the other two guys that were in the vehicle, so there were two other guys who had just started on with us, that my life had taken many paths in my 45 years, but that a friend intervened when I was at a low point and basically rescued me from death as well as utter failure. In the passing days before the job ended, I would go on to tell Manny and James that the friend to which I was referring in the car that day was Jesus. And I want to remind you of the verse that I shared before I began the story. Don't just pretend to love others. You got to really love them. And that's, I guess, the secret ingredient of what was keeping me from letting God use me at work was I wasn't really loving others. I, I was trying to be Christ to other people, but only within that span of when I was at the copy machine or when I was doing X, Y, and Z that would take me however much time and you had my half attention for that amount of time. And let's face it, some of our jobs, you really can't take your focus off those things because the next thing's coming. So it may not be during that time that you get to really love them. You may not be able to stop making what you're making and look at them and go, tell me about that because you have your prep time right now and I don't. Go ahead, tell me. You can't do that. So I'm not saying being crazy or ridiculous, but you can other times. You can invite them to go do things. You can actually invest in them and spend time. So if everything I could say, I could sum up, you have to actually love them. And that required some change in me. But I started to see any job that I did as, man, this is my mission field, and I'd never seen it that way before. This was 2015. It feels like I've been growing every year. And you might say, well, you're a teacher. You're supposed to be learning every year. You got a new curriculum, right? We're all supposed to be learning. I think every moment of our lives is a chance to learn. Sometimes it's about other people. Sometimes it's learning about the job that I'm doing. But I want to encourage you, whatever job you're in, God's in the do-over business. You can totally let God change you, even if you've made a mistake in the workplace, even if you feel like you've blown it. God redeems. We're all here because of that reason. He's redeemed us. He's changed us. Now let him use you at work. Okay, Lord, is this one of the people you're asking me to really love? Because let's face it, you only have so much time for so many people, yet you have to make space for your life in them. So I try to make space for one or two a year. Sometimes it comes from the summer job. Sometimes it comes from the teaching year. So as we close in prayer, that's what I'm going to pray for us. Imagine if the people that are sitting right here, if you're not doing it now, you just start looking at work as, okay, I'm going to let God start to change me in my workplace and show me how to love this person, even though I don't think I have time for two more people in my life. If you really mean it, if you really want to love them, and not just level Jesus to them, like, boom, I'm going to give you Jesus Christ. I'm done. I'm out of here. No, you're going to have to love them for quite a while before you get that. And believe it or not, after you've tried to love somebody for some time and it starts to take hold, then they're in your life. You can't get rid of them all the time. It's not like you can just say, okay, now I finally got to share Jesus with you. I'm still in touch with this young man. One of them moved away to Washington, D.C., and we still talk a couple times a year on the phone. He's doing really good. Manny, Gave his life to the Lord. He's come to church here a couple times. He's now going to his own church. And it's exciting to watch him grow in Jesus. And I've been blessed since I've had my teaching job at Cheney School District and I've worked most summers, have numerous guys. I get to be a part of watching them give their lives over to Christ. And I had never been a part of that before. So Lord, I pray that as we're leaving here, that you would fill us up with your Holy Spirit, that you would show us a couple people at work who are right uh, under our very eyes and ears and noses that you need us to love and we're the particular person for them. Show us how to actually spend some time developing that relationship and, and create some space in our, our daily schedules for that. I pray that these people here, you would allow them to surrender their lives to you every day and they would wait with the expectation as you change them, Lord God. And those that already are, they see their workplace as, a, as the great commission. Lord, Lord, I pray that you bless them. Bless them anew today as they leave here and walk out of here. Thank you, Jesus, uh, that you want to use us in your work. You don't, you don't have to, but 
you want to use us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for the time. Um, I know this is the weird part. Uh, I, when I was on staff here saying, uh, Jesus loves you, so do pastors Mark and Kate. <laughs> That's the part where Pastor Mark always said, make sure you say that. Okay, I will. Thank you, guys. Have a good Sunday.